Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who's joined us from around the, world, around the world. It is our joy to welcome you all to Black in Design 2021, celebrating Black spatial practices from the magical to the mundane. My name is Caleb Nagash. And I'm Tomi Laja, and we are co-chairs of this year's Black in Design Conference. On the fourth occasion of Black in Design, our organizing committee wanted to create a space where we could lift up and lift lift up the creativity and spatial practices that operate below the surface of design theory and praxis. Together, we had discourse on the quotidian, the spectacular, as well as the quiet moments that make up the everyday Black experience. We've framed this year's conference using the term magical to mundane to highlight the tensions, pulls, and necessary borrowing between the two. An everyday experience that one has no option but to endure and overcome becomes exceptional. And the magical becomes integral to the everyday, such as the critical imagination that arises through rest and retreat. Blackness is not monolithic and singular, but rather a shared identity through the experiences within an anti-Black world, holding anti-Black spaces and time. What tectonics and ped pedagogies can we extend and use in aid of our political imaginations? We chose to see our pandemic-induced virtual predicament as an opportunity to use Black and design as a portal to connect the multiplicities of Black consciousness, which can manifest through making. Perhaps, most importantly, we found ourselves connecting through the diversity of our lived Black experiences within the unique geographical, social, and political worlds we inhabit as a diaspora and on the continent. We hope that as you all enjoy this weekend's program, that you'll find inspiration in the magic that all our incredible speakers, panelists, performers, and collaborators bring. We also hope that you're able to find and make space for rest, reflection, and care, listening closely for the still, seemingly mundane moments in Black Matter, and following them to find their magic once again. We'd like to thank the entire team that came together to make this happen, including our Black and Design Organizing Committee, all of our sponsors, especially our major supporters at the Graham Foundation and Perkins and Will, our designers and creative collaborators, Fisk Projects, all the tireless folks in communications, events, and media services at the GSD, the GSD African American Student Union, and all of our Black and Design family that laid the groundwork for us. And most importantly, to each and every one of you attending Black and Design 2021. I'd also like to briefly announce that we will be recording all of our main events and sessions throughout the conference. Uh, so please be aware that as an attendee, your likeness may appear on our Black and Design or Harvard GSD social media channels over the course of the weekend. Now, before I welcome Dean Sarah Whiting onto the stage to say a few words, I am very excited to introduce Ashley Wilkerson, who will lead us all in an opening breath exercise. Ashley Wilkerson is a spirit-led actress, poet, trauma-informed meditation teacher, wellness practitioner, and consultant from Dallas, Texas, currently based in LA. She completed her Atma Yoga training at Tree South LA and received her mindfulness training from Deer Park Monastery. Ashley has shared her expertise on various platforms, such as the California Wellness Foundation, the Alliance for Safety and Justice, Revolve Impact, Black Women for Wellness, and the National Performance Network, among others. She is a principal member of Zeal Wellness and the founder of Brother Breathe, a mindfulness initiative designed for black boys and men. Ashley has coordinated healing spaces and circles for hundreds of crime survivors and has helped bring more calm and positivity to various educational, corporate, and creative sectors. Welcome, Ashley. Hello. Hello, my global family. And though I cannot see you, I feel you. And it's such an honor to be able to hold this sacred space and invite you all to really just check in with your breath and center for a bit. Um, this is going to be an amazing conference. And I just wanna remind you all to breathe, be gentle with yourself, and we're gonna have a good time. So wherever you are, I want to invite you Take that breath, get still. 
observe where there may be any tension. Usually for these type of things, it's in our shoulders. <laughs> so if you need to give yourself a nice little shoulder rub, do that. Go at your own pace. Gently roll your neck. Go the opposite way. Check in with your feet and your hands. We carry tension so many places we're not even aware of. So just give yourself permission to soften just a bit. And when you feel comfortable, Close your eyes. Invite your breath. Tell it to slow down just a bit. Remembering that all is well. In this moment, all is well. Hmm. What a gift it is to be alive. Take a few moments to observe your belly rising and falling with each inhale and each exhale. Listen to your own natural rhythm Give yourself what you need. Allow any sounds or distractions to just float on by. This is a sacred space. If you're feeling any anxiousness and you can't get as comfortably as you'd like, Place your hand on your heart and maybe another hand on your belly. And just rest here for a while. Now I want you to think about one thing that you're grateful for. It could be this conference. It could be your coffee, your family, the sacred breath. And breathe in more of that gratitude. Hmm. And release that gratitude out. Let that goodness cover you and everyone else on this platform. And we can just send it all out into the world.
Take a deep breath in through your nose. Out through your mouth. Two more times, breathe in. And release. Breathe in goodness. Breathe out love. Gently open your eyes. Give yourself a nice little body massage. You can even hug yourself. <laughs> yeah. Let's enjoy this conference. Thank you. Oh my gosh. That was amazing, Ashley. Um, we need that reminder to pause and take a moment and enter into the moment um, for everything we do. So um, thank you very much. That was extraordinary. I'm Sarah Whiting. I'm Dean of Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. And I'm here really just to give thanks and to open the show, but I should take zero credit for this show. I want to thank Caleb Nagash and Tomi Laja for um, being the co-chairs of this year's Black and Design Conference. I want to thank the GSD's African American Student Union, particularly the Black and Design Steering Committee, Nick Gray, Wanjiku Nagare, Tosin Odubengbe, and Somala Dibi, who's from MIT. And I really like that we have that collaboration with um, MIT on this team this year. I also want to thank Paige Johnston, Kat Chavez, and Matt Smith from the school's events team. So this is the fourth Black and Design Conference, and the third one actually was pretty much right after I first started here as Dean. It was the Black Futurism Conference in November of 2019. And I remember the power of that conference. Um, I was standing in line for the coffee, which if everyone remembers, came late. At least there was coffee at that conference and we were in person and I was standing in line and I was next to someone who had come from Oklahoma and someone else who had come from New Jersey. Being the group of people who were brought together for that conference in Piper Auditorium at the GSD. I'm disappointed like everyone else that this can't be in person this year, but I actually also am excited by the fact that we can actually reach a, a far broader crowd this year as a result through this platform. And so I'm excited to see how this conference has a different resonance and how it pairs with the conference, the conferences that had been in person. So um, I, want to, I want to thank the team. I'm also really excited about this year's theme. I think everyone who knows me knows that words matter a lot to me. And I love the title Black Matter for its many resonances. You know, the magical the, to the mundane is a, a really good way of putting it. I also am a big fan of alliteration. But so matter has two immediate meanings, one of importance and one of material. And that really resonates very well with the School of Design. Um, the significance, you know, that things matter, things are important, um, and that things are material. And it's through design, through design's material presence in the world that we affect things and we can change things. I also appreciate that this conference recognizes that matter includes care and Ashley's bringing us together was one version of that, but I think that that's a, a reminder that we all need to keep in mind. So we're going to turn to the conference and first a quick reminder about some features that you'll find in this Hopin stage, which is slightly different from Zoom, but carries a lot of similarities. Our keynote speaker will respond to questions after she's finished her lecture. So feel free to submit questions into the queue at any time using the chat feature to the right of your browser window. And now for today's event to start us off. Empo Matsipa 
is a current Loeb Fellow at the GSD. She's an educator, a researcher, and a cur curator. She's based at the School of Architecture and Planning at the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. Empa received her PhD in architecture from UC Berkeley. She's a researcher at the Wits Institute for Social and Economic Research and a co-investigator on an Andrew Mellon research grant on mobilities, temporalities, and African political futures housed in the African Center for Society and Migration Studies. Dr. Matsipa has written critical essays on art and architecture, and she's curated several exhibitions and discursive platforms, including the South Africa Pavilion at the Venice Biennale in 2008, the African Mobilities 2.0 podcast series, and the Studio X Johannesburg. Her curatorial practice aims to support independent research practices across and beyond the African continent and to democratize access by promoting discursive mobility among Black and African artists, scholars, and designers. I'm really delighted and excited that Mpo is here with us at the GSD this year as a Loeb Fellow. And I'm super excited to hear her open this year's Black and Design Conference, Black Matters. Thank you very much and welcome everyone to Black Matters. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, um, Dean Whiting. It's, it's such an honor to be invited um, to speak at the Black and Design Conference today. And I really want to thank the organizers for their tireless work in putting um, a great program together and also for the warm reception I've had at Harvard. Um, so far. I also want to acknowledge um, the Loeb Fellowship for making my time at Harvard GSD possible and importantly my students, um, friends, collaborators, co-conspirators across the global diaspora who've held this body of work together in equal measure of fellowship and love and without whom I would probably still be a sniveling mess in Johannesburg. I also want to take this moment to acknowledge my family, um, my long-suffering family, and also those who couldn't be with us today and mindful of the fact that, um, that the work we do in, in, in celebrating and honoring um, Black life um, is an ongoing intergenerational project. Um, so I'm just going to, to jump right into it. Um, Matt, please, please may I have my slides? So um, when invited to think about Black Matter, um, the first thing that came to mind was the question of time, um, partly because of the kind of temporal suspension that we've all had to undergo over this very strange, peculiar period, but also thinking about Black temporalities as already and always um, marked by the sign of crisis. But I want to start in a different place, which is where my foundational thinking about Black diasporic imaginaries and creative networks reside. Um, and I'm really interested how um, sites of urban decay and abandonment um, have also been a site where Black people have reimagined new worlds and created those worlds in turn. So black hair braiding practices in Bree Street in downtown Johannesburg is my entry point into thinking about black matter and black time. African hair braiding offers a glimpse into how immigration, black female sexuality, and shifts in urban retail economies provide important economic and cultural resources in urban uh, important economic and cultural resources to urban residents and users. As both ontology, epistemology, and method, black hair braiding recalibrates local economies, spaces, and aesthetic codes, and thus co-constitutes emergent urban identities and a way of knowing the city. The intimate, networked, and fractal nature of black hair braiding spaces disrupts the rigid colonial spatial narratives of the city and its architecture. As an epistemology, braiding disrupts the grand narrative of Johannesburg as a city in crisis, and as method, it disrupts the colonizing and gendered structure of urban studies itself. Hair braiding practices in downtown Johannesburg also has profound spatial ramifications. 
They invert intimate practices of bodily care, which would otherwise be considered private and feminine activities, and they transform zones of precarity, economic and cultural exchange into a viable public domain. As a site of cultural production, Bree Street was made up of both of these was made up of identities of both South Africans and those who have been unhomed in downtown Johannesburg. These hairdressers and touts served as points of connection in a network of women in abandoned retail spaces and office spaces that constitute a distinctive aesthetic practice, a spatial practice, and a business network with global reach. The practice provides an example of how networking and scaling practices can confound and hack an established Euclidean spatial order of the existing modernist urban city grid and its associated institutional forms. These networked economies reconfigured and generated complex itinerant micro geographies that reanimate underutilized office and retail spaces in the inner city. Hair care is a vital source of employment for women who make up a large portion of the informal economy in sub-Saharan Africa. In Johannesburg too, hair has come to play an increasingly important role in the employment of many local and migrant women in the informal economy. The growth of the dry hair care industry reflects both rising demand about hair con from hair conscious um, African women and low barriers to entry. Although hairdressing requires considerable skill, it is nevertheless an important point of entry to employment for newcomers to the city and a potential avenue for social mobility. African hair is not merely a localized subsistence economy. It is a highly differentiated business. It has become a multi-billion dollar industry that stretches from Africa, Europe, and the Americas to China and India and beyond, drawing in local conglomerates such as L'Oreal and Unilever. However, estimates of the African hair care business do not include the largely informal hair dry care market. This is weaves, extensions, wigs, crafted from everything from synthetic fiber to human hair. The global expansion of black hair business signals not only the entanglements of South African and mainstream global aesthetic economies and networks, but also locates African women within multi-scalar circuits of production and consumption, as well as inner city property regimes. At this level, at this local level, furthermore, the profusion of styles offered on Bree Street radically reorders locally established codes of bodily management and appearance that depart from regimes of control under colonialism and apartheid. This dynamic layering of activities and uses creates collision zones in the city or points of contamination among different constituencies that would otherwise be dispersed or exist as discrete social communities. This in turn generates different social patterns thresholds and temporalities such that taken for granted territorializations and cartographies of knowledge production were reconstituted as a porous network of negotiation, exchange and collaboration, which may serve as a template for thinking about black spatial futures and the future of architectural pedagogy. This disruption of the established order of the modernist apartheid city is similar in part to insurgent citizenship within a highly unequal and differentiated society. And explicitly con it explicitly contrasts the disembodied view of planners and architects with the intimate and situated view of those creatively making lives and spaces that the modernist regime of planning knowledge frames as a slum. This form of insurgency constitutes a counter politics that destabilizes the present and renders it fragile. As argued by scholars like James Holston, insurgent citizenship bubbles up from the past in places where present circumstances seem pr propitious for an eruption. In this view, the present is like a bog, leaky, full of holes, gaps, contradictions, and misunderstandings. I want to shift now to, so um, just, to, just to clarify that, you know, this, uh, one of my favorite pictures by a South African photographer called da Dalia Malbane, and she's done an entire photographic series on um, hair braiders um, in her town in Mafiging um, in South Africa. But what was really interesting about her documentation, which also began in downtown Johannesburg, was the ways in which um, African migrant and immigrant women have completely scrambled codes around what is public and what is private. And this kind of raised a lot of interesting questions for me around the question of representation. So 
scholars like Catherine McKittrick argue about, you know, the unrepresentability, the unintelligibility of black spatial practices when it's viewed within sort of traditional normative spatial, spatial, spatial grammars. And I think that this idea of unrepresentability is, is so pronounced in the discipline of architecture and planning because so much of black spatial practice doesn't enter into what is considered legitimate architectural spatial knowledge. So it ra the fact that the, the profusion of these practices raises questions around representation, it raises questions about um, the limits of working within a given canon, and also points to the potential for um, what it means to think space and live space and theorize space from this position, from the street, from the edge, and also from the perspective of my hairdresser. So this really, uh, sorry, right. So this is this is a plan of um, downtown Johannesburg that is, and, and this is where you find a profusion of dry hair care providers, really uh, like a dense concentration of them. And, and what was really striking for me um, is the way in which um, these practices basically occupy sites in the city that have been um, sites of abandonment, where capital, um, big capital, conglomerate capital doesn't take hold. Um, and 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 the intense creativity and versatility of the space is something that needs to be theorized beyond um, the registers of informality. But what was also interesting to me in reading um, the space of dry hair care um, providers and women hairdressers is the way in which the, their practices and their boards and their aesthetic codes produce a different map, a remapping of the city as it's known and, pre and present an opportunity to think about new vocabularies for thinking about space. So that leads me, but you know, this is also part of a constellation of other kinds of spatial practices that are kind of homogenized under the label of informality. Um, and so over, over the last 10 years, I've worked with students, I've worked with um, professors at Columbia University, just really sort of trying to decode, understand, unpack, um, and, and re-describe how the city has transformed since the end of white minority rule in 1994. But what I really wanted to talk about in terms of giving you a sense of um, in, a, in, in, in the sense of giving you the sense of some of the ways that I've been thinking around this question of black space and time is by doing a very quick review of African Mobilities, this exhibition that I started working on in collaboration with the Architecture Museum at TU München in 2017. And that has taken on a life of its own um, with various other collaborators and partners along the way. So African Mobility started as um, African Mobilities. This is not a refugee camp exhibition that I curated. And uh, that was really part of this collaboration between Wits University and the Architecture Museum in Germany. It was funded by the German Federal Government Cultural Foundation. And the show opened in April, 2018 as an architect at the Architecture Museum in Munich. It set the stage for exploring the multiple ways in which one might grapple with epistemic closure within the discipline in popular discourse. It was a collaborative, process-driven, future-oriented exhibition that sought to augment already existing creative research projects on various modes of mobility and immobility in Africa and the diaspora. Yet it also seemed to offer a moment of pause. The exhibition was organized around three themes, cartographies, speculative futures, and prototypes. And the design brief that I developed together with Wolf Architects, a Cape Town-based design practice, called for a space of delay and an invitation to engage with the archive and how African-oriented thinkers approach future urban imaginaries and architectural and urban prototypes that are instigated by a world in motion. As the curator, I was very interested in exploring collaboratively alternative imaginaries of the future and role of architectural research and design as a possible site for the invention of invention for designers and by designers and thinkers from Africa and the diaspora. It was an experiment in how to constitute a relational, multi-scale and multi-sided approach to African urbanization in an exploded space-time in which the majority of migration occurs on the African continent. It sought out imaginative ruptures or porosity between rigid compartmentalizations of architectural and urban research and creative practice by African practitioners. The exhibition explored how architecture responds to the complexities of migration and circulation of people, resources, aesthetics and ideas, both in physical space and in spaces of the imagination. 
These ongoing explorations constituted and challenged provisional cartographies of power and desire. They raised a number of questions about which narratives Africans choose to tell, how we tell them, and how so much of our knowledge about African cities and architecture is circumscribed by a range of political interests rooted in hegemonic colonial discourses. So, uh, so in thinking through this question of circulation, I was also thinking about the ways in which black suffering and black migration is often represented in mass media through the kind of spectacle of the suffering black body. So part of the imaginative work, which is something that Toni Morrison talks about a lot as a site of sovereignty and a site of freedom, was about thinking about what it means to create, a, create a, an imaginative space in which Africans can reimagine the kinds of futures that they want, particularly in a context where African futures are seen to be compressed between two horizons of the future and the past. So it's a kind of eternal present. Um, but also what I really want, so these are just some of the works. This, this is an artwork um, produced by Aisha Balde, who, um, uh, was an architecture student um, in 2016 at the University of Johannesburg who produced these really complex mappings of kind of creating an imaginary site off the Cape, off the coast of, of Cape Verde. And this idea of site is something that is constituted rather than a given and how it is produced through a range of different power relations that are mapped onto each other and create new territorializations and deterritorializations de of the black body in space. However, there were other kinds of mappings that I explored, including um, the mapping of how knowledges about African movement and African circulation are, are clustered around different bodies and practices of knowledge. Um, that is beyond sort of the discourse of crisis or the figure of um, the black body in pain. And this was a really sort of productive crowdsource library that I assembled in collaboration with Chimurenga, um, who produced the Chimurenga Library on Circulations. So this is the front side of the map, which is basically the different kind of thematic clusters. And on the, on, on the back side of the map is an index of all the different ways in which one can begin to engage with the question of circulation, um, which is not limited only to books, but also to music, to artworks, um, to poetry and different kinds of um, cultural production that are often left outside of architectural discussions around circulation and movement on the African continent. Um, and this was also coming from a place, this is a, a map of the municipal boundaries of Johannesburg that is highly unequal. So um, in a city that was historically um, constituted through kind of um, racial hierarchies and segregation, we still have a kind of persistent um, city map where um, the wealthy and privileged live to the largely north of the city and um, the most impoverished communities, the ones who have the least opportunities, the least mobility, tend to be segregated in the south of the city. So the question around how the inner city, which is the the, the space in the center of the map in red, um, has been transformed by rapid African urbanization, was presented often throughout my education as a student and even as a young as a young academic at Wits University as crisis, as the graying of the city, and and somehow a kind of hearkening to some kind of apocalyptic vision or a crisis of the city as as it is currently known. Um, so part of the work that I was trying to do with African mobilities and through my collaborations with various incredible artists across the diaspora was to come up with a set of representations that both are cognizant of the multiple temporalities in which Africans live and also the kind the, the diverse range of representations that that our experimentation and exploration of these temporalities and spatialities can assume. So here you have the opening hall at the Architecture Museum, where there's a juxtaposition between the work of Sami Baloji, a very well-known Congolese visual artist, who was documenting um, Belgian colonial uh, settlement planning in Lubumbashi, and it's juxtaposed to the um, post-oil extractive landscape of Lagos in the near future that was created by Olele Kanjefus in collaboration with Wale Lawal. Um, so the exhibition, um, working across these multiple themes, um, and this is the this is the Chimurenga Library as a physical space and a space of pause. 
So, so the idea was really also about how can we think through the experience of movement and black bodies moving through space. And one of the major um, late motifs of the exhibition and also in my own thinking was around the question of delay. So um, rather than thinking about delay only as negativity, I was very interested in thinking about what it means to pause and the different kinds of ways in which pause spaces or obstructions and obstacles can be re reimagined and recalibrated through design, through intellectual intervention, through creative work. Um, additionally, one of the things that I was very concerned with was the circulation of ideas and the circulation of people across the African continent and in conversation with each other. So African Mobility staged a number of exchanges um, in seven different cities across the diaspora, including New York, um, in which I invited designers to come and um, engage with local um, design students in various cities across the African continent. That was also the, the basis for possible future collaborations amongst practitioners practitioners who might not be able to meet that easily. And this was coming out of a context where I had hosted numerous traveling studios from elite institutions in North America, but was also very cognizant of the differential asymmetrical mobility that is afforded to African students. So while, um, you know, elite, well-resourced universities can take the students in the before times on these traveling studios, this was not an option that was easily and readily available to African design students. So, um, this idea of circulation was built into not only as a subject matter of the exhibition, but also conceptualizing the exhibition and my role of, as curator as a kind of distributional practice. So the exhibition was not just an event, it was a practice, it was a set of networks, it was a set of socialities that in some ways was really sort of inspired by the hair salon model, where you basically need a chair, a comb, a table, two people in conversation, and, and it opens up an entire universe around how to understand the city. Um, the second iteration of African Mobilities was to be a traveling exhibition, and our landing space was in Lagos, Nigeria, uh, where in collaboration with the white space um, with the white space in, in Lagos, we hosted an, uh, um, a very sort of limited exhibition of the work that had been produced in Lagos, but also had a public staging and a screening of the films that Olalek and Jefus and Wale Lawal had produced as part of the African Mobilities project. So um, here you see um, the exhibition opening at a white space gallery um, in 2019, and below we had VR installations underneath Falomo Bridge in Lagos um, that was really sort of open to the public. And these were all fee-free events that were about really constituting new publics, new conversations about what the future would be. Um, and then the third, the third dimension of um, of African Mobilities, which is African Mobilities 2.0, occurred after a uh, pandemic time and really was an opportunity for me to think about how to archive the rich conversations that we'd had about the different cities and the, and the different issues that were raised in these different cities um, in, in order to bring in wider publics. So over the course of 2020, with my creative team, I was able to produce a 12 episode podcast series called African Mobilities 2.0 that really sort of revisited some of the major themes of the exhibition in Munich, but also deepened our understanding and re-theorized some of these things Given, given the amount of time that had passed since the staging of the exhibition in 2018 and the release of the podcast series in 2020. Um, so that's just a very quick overview of, um, of the work. And, and, you know, it was partly, it, there were many different models that inspired this work. One of them was Studio X, um, was the Studio X program or the Studio X project that was initiated by Mark Wigley at Columbia University. But the other model was uh, Ola BC's Ashiko, which was an itinerant curatorial school that had different landing landing um, sites across the African continent that really sort of brought different publics together. But whereas the Studio X model was really sort of a corporate structure that centered around Columbia University, what I was really interested in was kind of distributing the resources um, in order to kind of counterbalance the real fact that most of the people who were in the exhibition would never be able to see it while it was staged in Munich. So in thinking through what, our, what curatorial practice might be, I was also thinking about how curatorial practice can also be an infrastructural project that connects fragmented infrastructures across the African continent. And these are knowledge and cultural infrastructures, particularly as they relate to architecture. Um, 
I'm sure you're all familiar with with this work by Ole Lekan, which was a starting point for the work that um, he produced for African mobilities. And this was um, another one of the stagings of um, of African mobilities in Lagos. And this is uh, Wale Lawal and Ole Lekan on uh, Lagos Lagoon. And I'm probably the person taking the picture, uh, teetering over the edge of a canoe on the other side of, of the camera. Um, and what they really produced um, was was quite an interesting range. It was it was both a graphic novella, it was um, a VR installation, and and three films, thinking and theorizing Lagos in the near future, and really thinking about, um, really inspired by and and thought through and produced by Wale Lawal in thinking about post oil futures and what the future of Lagos would be from an ecological point of view from from the future of the human, from the future of the city, and the kind of social relations that an economy based on extraction um, portends. Um, but I don't think that this is a uniquely Lagosian situation, but maybe a situation that speaks to many parts of Africa where there has been large-scale extraction um, over the last 400 years, including the extraction of human beings. In thinking about black matter and spatial practices, though, I'm increasingly moved to think about time. And more to the point, the fact that black people are often forced to wait. Waiting is a temporary non-arriving arrival, a transitory state of not yet that is characterized by ambiguity and inversion. It may result in being rendered unmappable, a people or people who have no stable temporal references, and for whom the exact timing of progress from one temporal location to the next is largely unknown. While waiting is intrinsic to the human condition, waiting nevertheless has a wide range of modalities that range from hope, romantic longing and gratifying, that's gratifying, to frustration and despair, and of course, the apocalyptic. Tony Morrison suggests that the idea of Africa in the West is an idea that is fraught with the assumptions of a complex intimacy coupled with an acknowledgement of unmediated estrangement. So the literary tropes that surround Africa are, are the exact replicas of what she describes as foreignness. One, that Africa is threatening. Two, Africa is depraved. Three, Africa as incomprehensible. This conundrum of the dispossession of native peoples constitutes an exile within one's home that not only enables the projection of colonial fantasies of Africa as void, as timeless, as ripe for intervention or extraction, but also the dystopian character of imperialism as catastrophe for the majority world. As, as argued by Catherine Yusuf, imperialism and ongoing settler colonialism have been ending worlds for a very, very long time indeed. Additionally, when waiting is marked by political, economic, and ecological disturbance, these disturbances in turn disrupt temporalities that in turn disrupt identity formation. Scholars like Catherine McKittrick argue that this unmappability and temporal suspension may be considered one articulation of black time and space. Unlike linear time, black time moves in many directions at once. Twisted time, stretched time, deep time, dead time, suspended time, wasted time, hard time, liminal time, slow time. The distribution of waiting coincides with the distribution of power. There are those who wait and there are those who are waited for. Waiting is one of the permanent effects of the distribution of power because waiting is a form of submission that is assigned to black people, the poor, the subalternate, the weak, the undocumented immigrant, the refugee, and to women and sexually repressed and misgendered people. This form of waiting, according to Pierre Bourdieu, is an exercise of power that plays a significant role in shaping compliant subjects in everyday life within disciplinary rep temporal regimes that differentiate between the waiting and the non-waiting. The extended imposition of waiting, of being delayed, of being held back, pushes people outside the regulated normative modernist temporal schedules and boundaries that structure everyday social life. 
To wait one's turn, which may or may never come, is to be at the mercy of those who control space and time. In conditions of prolonged waiting and delay, the waiting individual may have feelings of powerlessness and vulnerability because, as argued by Mbembe and Reutemann, there is a lack of correspondence between everyday life practices and indeterminacy produced by constant flux and waiting, which creates an absence of shared imaginaries that have a material basis and collective understanding to which people refer in order to make sense of their lives. At times when waiting is a permanent condition, when people are kept waiting interminably, when waiting is filled with dread, the experience of prolonged liminality and uncertainty assumes a punitive form of disciplinary temporal power, or what ta Coates and Brittany Cooper simply describe as theft. However, black temporalities are also promiscuous, precisely because the delay locates one in a liminal state of being, which has transgressed and violated expected temporal boundaries. This form of temporal transgression, of being out of time, creates a shift in spatial and temporal coordinates that repeatedly disrupt linear time and hold open the possibility for reorganization or manipulation of time and the enactment of diverse futures in the immediate present. Far more than relentless presentism of merely being squeezed between two receding horizons of the past and the present, in the immediate time, black time actually intensifies a deep sense of presence and the future simultaneously through aspirations, hopes for a better future and need to reconfigure current damnation. This temporality, the state of temporal suspension can be stretched, twisted to accommodate both imaginative failures and utopian moments that are enabled by desire. One of the spatial forms that waiting takes for black people is the queue, which I've argued elsewhere in a forthcoming article in EFLUX. The etymology of the word is rooted in Old French, meaning tail or queue, or a mass of people organized in such a way as to resemble a tail or a snake. Citing Teju Cole, Bedkin notes the objectification of migrants in lines at the Moira camp for migrants in Greece where she quotes him saying, they are waiting to be allowed to be human or waiting for the war to end. Queuing is often one of the dominant images associated with the spatialization of bureaucratic power. The queue serves as a reminder of a certain administrative, oh, sorry. The queue, the queue serves as a reminder of a certain administrative logic and also a certain belatedness and delay that sheds light on how power relates, on how power relations, forms of knowledge and subjectivities are constructed and reified. The duration of this belatedness of indefinitely waiting one's turn is mapped onto racialized and gendered subjects and geographies. The temporal construct of waiting for a visa, for residency papers, for healthcare, for border control, for the lights or water to return, for the funding application to be approved, for postponements, for bureaucratic practices and mistakes, for changing legislative requirements, for freedom from tyr tyr tyranny and border regimes, or what Sharam Koshravi describes as bordering, is marked by the existential condition of waiting for the unknown, waiting for necessary transformation in one's life course. The figure of the migrant here, the refugee, the marginalized and racialized, emphasizes a socio-temporal order in which both a real and imaginary symbolic cue emerges. This temporal scheme is embedded within prevailing expectations of who should be next. As such, the foreigner, the displaced person, the person who waits, stands in as a sign of bad timing in the orderliness of everyday rhythms of capitalism, as well as the wish to restore and fix potential irregularities. As a temporal map, the queue sets out expectations about the practice of standing in line. That means that one is being taken into consideration for admission, so one must wait one's turn. The queue defines the collective temporal boundaries and orderly arrangements for synchronization in everyday life fixed forms of temporal organization that are sequential and synchronized, 
that create and maintain hierarchical relations within the matrix of power between those who wait and those for whom others must wait and those who wait without end. Whereas the bread lines in the former Soviet Union, for instance, served as a system of distribution and distinction based on access to goods and services, in capitalist societies of the West, waiting time generally carries pejorative connotations, partly because capitalist society identifies time with productivity, such that wasting time is wasting time. Waiting time is wasting time. In this context, the queue makes marks a disruption of linear time and the chrononormative temporalities of unimpended progress, efficiency, and speed. Born of an economy of scarcity, the queue as an urban phenomena in the Soviet regime and states hollowed out by neoliberal capitalist practices in the majority world aimed to seize time from individuals by making exorbitant demands on the human body as the site for many possible uses of time. An economy of scarcity resulted in immobilized bodies engaged in complicated and often tiring activities that might otherwise seem quite basic. In her analysis of the racial politics of time, Brittany Cooper argues that theft or white control over black people's time enables those in authority to control black people through control of their time. This disciplinary temporality a metaphorical cue allows dominant forces in white settler society to determine the pace of social transformation and the extent of inclusion. Cooper, alongside many other theorists, argues that racist views that black people occupy space asynchronously is often used to legitimize extreme forms of violence. This contestation between those who are deemed to occupy space and those who control time instantiates ongoing processes of racialized dispossession and other forms of spatial violence like excessive policing, white flight, slight clearance, gentrification, and exclusion. Being out of time can also be attributed to other forms of delay and a loss of time, wasted time, lost years due to, pure, due to poor health, due to mold, lead poisoning, poisoned water, poisoned soil, poisoned air, high incarceration rates, extra juridical killings, lack of secure public housing, etc. Black people, according to Cooper, have always been out of time, or conversely, time is used as a disciplinary mechanism to justify their removal from space and the collective imagination of who belongs where. However, the cue might also have exuberant and reparative gestures that emerge in response to the disintegration of colonial narrative and foreclosure of settler futures. The liminal time of the cue and refusal of disciplinary and normalizing mechanisms of power produces a state of radical unknowability, indeterminacy, and unintelligibility. Thus, black time as liminal, non-linear time has the potential to unsettle a clear hierarchy and a neat binary opposition in which one modality of being should transform into another. The black temporality of the queue, not unlike queer temporality, carries ludic and liberatory traits that generates new forms of art and subjectivity. Thus, the queue also gives rise to line specialists, to line tactics, non-normative temporalities, confused, opaque identities in order to avoid asymmetrical power relations and harmful ideological interpolation. The stagnant and initially enigmatic quality of the line incites change and desire. Artists and curators on the African continent and the global diaspora have reanimated stagnation in an attempt to internalize the phenomenology of the queue as a collection of voices, a collection of statements without an addressee, disembodied sounds, re-embodied sounds, truncated exchanges, overhead snippets of conversation and intense socialities. In these stagings, time is stretched, distorted in movements and scale duration, while the present moment is frozen and mined for potential in its very incompleteness. The queue might also be understood as the site that offers odd and compensatory spatio-temporal frames, orality and opportunities for discovery, aliveness, and emotional fulfillment. 
these queer temporalities, these black temporalities, reactivate hope through a reconceptualization of stagnation as a libidinally saturated and magical temporal order. In other words, we're always already out of time anyway. In a very different discussion about the plight of unmarried women in Israel and the struggle against heteronormative temporal ideologies, Lahad laments, and I quote, it is unclear whether or not the queue can be beaten and whether there is any potential for queue jumping, queue drifting, leaving the queue altogether, non-waiting, unwaiting, to not have to stand in line anymore. These notions of being out of time and queue jumping and queue drifting find space for their own unfolding through curatorial practices that are rooted in rerouting the resources of space and time to those populations that are often overlooked, delayed, held back, or excluded from the normative publics of the museum and the university. This rerouting gives rise to new imaginaries of how institutions might expand the creative potential of the queue and its opportunities for surprising intimacies, situational loyalties created by the incongruity between social practice and signification for those who have been unhomed within and into the cities in which they take refuge. The queue is thus not so much timeless as temporarily elastic, a suspension that nonetheless moves and transforms. The line as an organism, as a unified, embodied entity that grunts, undulates, feels, changes, shapes, changes shape in metaph metaphysically exceptional states. Line, identity loses its certainty and, and reality loses its hold. This radical instability of the line as a structuring mechanism for the distribution of waiting time can move in several directions at once. That of creative pursuits, that of the mob, of protest, of inertia, of refusal, of subversion, of reinvention in public and private spaces. In thinking about black futures and the future of time, I return here to Morrison who wrote an essay by the same title, The Future of Time, Literature and Diminished Expectations. Morrison identifies disruption and, and apocalyptic yearnings as a lament for a return to the ideologies of progress and continuity in the in the modern West, but also identifies the modern West as a site from which imaginaries for the future are at their most impoverished. In fact, according to Morrison, the modern West is increasingly seeking out the past amidst the detritus of the present, in which the political realm is already catastrophe. Reading various white apocalyptic texts, Morrison suggests that such dire readings of the future are, and I quote, a mourning, a requiem, a folding away of time's own future, unquote. In bridging the space between a harrowing past and redemptive future, and rather than obstinate optimism, Morrison argues that the future is inflected with race, emerges within a milieu that is gendered, colonized, displaced, hunted. So in closing, I want to leave you with a further quote by Morrison, which I reappropriate under the banner of reimagining black time. And here she is. Perhaps it is the reality of a future as durable and far-reaching as the past, a future that will be shaped by those who have been pressed to the margins, by those who have been cloaked with the demon's cape. Perhaps it is the contemplation of that future that has occasioned a tremble of latter-day prophets, afraid that the current equilibria is a stirring, not an erasure. That not only is history not dead, but that it is about to take its first unfettered breath. Not soon, perhaps not in 30 years or 50, because such a breath, such a massive intake will take time, but it will be there. Early in the text, Morrison suggests, what becomes most compelling, and I quote, therefore, are the places and voices where the journey into the cellar of time is a rescue of source, an excavation for the purposes of building, discovering, envisioning a future. Some writers disagree with prevailing notions of futurelessness. They very much indeed not only but insist on a future that for them, for us, history is beginning again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mpo. Wow, what an incredibly thoughtful, thought-provoking uh, presentation. Um, and I think really to even use one of your own terms, you know, uh, everything you discussed, it really helps us to sort of recalibrate 
um, our thinking about space and time really actually in exactly the ways that we we had really hoped for, you know, as our team was kind of discussing and having conversations about black matter um, over the last year. So thank you so much. Um, just you. a reminder, <laughs> yeah, uh, just a reminder to the audience, uh, please feel free, submit comments, questions, and thoughts um, uh, for Impo, and and we'll just kick right off. Um, so, so I I wanted to I wanted to ask if you could uh, talk a little more. I think what I loved about what you um, you know everything you just said was really the kind of spatial terms that you use when talking about time, right? Which which you know things, especially when you when you went into the section about twisting and stretching and slowness and um, the ability to sort of really think about time as a very present material and then actually like an element of the built environment um, mm -hmm. and that sort of out in, in a lot of the projects you showed as well. And so um, I was just hoping you could say a little bit more. I know we have a lot of, um, obviously with the Black and Design audience is largely built environment, right? Designers. Um, we have a lot of architects, we have a lot of planners, and especially even myself, I'm thinking about this from my position as a student, you know, of architecture. And and I wonder if you could say more, yeah, about thinking about time as a spatial dimension and how, you know, what impacts that has on architectural practice. Um, and, and also just a note too, that I love that you did point out architecture is just one spatial practice among many. And so, yeah, I'm curious to hear more about that. Um, I think, I think that one of the, um, I don't know if this is going to answer your question and, and I, and I want to invite a conversation rather than some authoritative voice. Cause I don't, I don't have the answers. This is where I'm at. Right. So it's a work in progress and the thinking out loud, but I, you know, when one of, See, there's some temporal suspension. Uh, so I think that, you know, when I was, um, to think about um, the history of Johannesburg, for instance, so all the textbooks that tell the history of Johannesburg talk about how the city started in 1896 when so-and-so found a nugget of gold. And so time begins in, um, in 1896. And, and what this does is erase an entire history of settlement and movement and extraction and mining uh, and gold forging that, that, that preceded it. So there's a way in which capturing time limits our spatial imagination because we assume that the way that space is organized in the present is the way that space will continue into the future. And there's a kind of inevitability about it because we understand space out of time. We don't understand the kind of spatial depth that has shaped or produced um, um, particular particular spaces. So I I would actually turn that question back to you because I don't I haven't fully figured it out. You know what what how how does thinking about time and different times produce different kinds of spatial imaginations, and how does understanding the history of place and the history of spaces and communities reshape the way that we imagine the kinds of futures that are available or possible? Um, I'm thinking about um, the Black Reconstructions exhibition that just came down at MoMA, and how some of the work was really an excavation of erasure, right, where you have these sedimentations or these these um, layers of erasure of black settlement, of black economic activity, black towns that don't make it into the curriculum because they no longer exist. So what does it mean to revisit those histories of black entrepreneurship in American cities in the in the immediate reconstruction era as a model for how to imagine the future of neighborhoods going forward? So I think that thinking through time and thinking through history is also about understanding that history itself is not singular that there are multiple histories and that there are hegemonic histories and then there are subjugated histories. So that history is not just this kind of passive thing, matter, that gets mined, but but actually about um, sedimentations of history, repressed histories, subjugated histories, and what is the kind of work that one has to do in order to sort of bring that to the surface that informs a, a kind of imagination for the pub, for, um, for alternative futures. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that and that totally speaks to a, a lot of what you said, too, about the limits of working within our particular canons, right? And and so what what would it mean, in fact, to actually envision or spatialize the world from a different standpoint, um, whether, you know, sort of more broadly speaking from the margins or, you know, from what's called a slum or, you know, from the from the vantage point of a hairdresser, for example. I mean, yeah, I think it is it's a challenge. It's an open question, you know, and 
And, I've and I think really... it's a question that we all, we that well, that that I would like to pose to, because I assume that, you know, I'm addressing many, many designers and design students that, you know, what does it mean to think, to think the city, to think design from that perspective, and also to think it beyond the kind of framework of development, because, because, you know, Africa gets very, this is my, this is my pet peeve, that Africa gets very quickly enfolded in the language of development, which is also a kind of modernist discourse of progress with the idea that, you know, that there's a kind of um, um, vanishing point uh, to which we must all sort of aspire. So, um, so how do, how, what does it mean to think, to think time beyond the kind of logics of progress um, as they've been defined in kind of modernist, modernist um, grammars? Right. Yeah, and to and to speak a little more too about I mean you you spoke um, quite eloquently I think about um, subjectivity and and multiple um, different kinds of subjectivities that might inhabit the world and kind of uh, change so you talked about for example I guess broadly black temporality and also queer temporalities and and we have a um, a question from the audience um, from Toby about um, the idea of the queue and maybe also bringing in the dimension of class, social class. And I know that you have, um, you've talked a bit as well about, um, well, when we had conversations too, thinking about black temporality and for example, um, using the exhibition colored people time as a jumping off point mm -hmm. and thinking about, right. And thinking about the, um, the way that actually when you imagine much more broadly and globally, which is also, you know, a big goal of ours this year in the conference, um, yeah, what are those what are those elements of class and geography and other sort of elements that actually start to fragment and um, I guess disaggregate black temporality in an interesting way? Well, I think that I think that this idea that 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 black temporalities are multiple is important, and that there are moments of suspension and there are moments of compression. And so, when thinking about you know the the position of somebody who's black and poor, or black and poor and queer, or black and queer, that 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 one is subjected to different to different regimes, right? To different temporal regimes based on your relative privilege or relative power in relation to the person who's imposing these things. But I also think that there's something problematic about, first of all, the intersection of race and classes is, is something that one should always be attentive to. But I also struggle conceptually with disarticulating race from class hmm. because of the way that capitalism historically has been raced, right? So if you read C.L.R. James um, or... Um, or you know how Europe uh, underdeveloped Africa. What you understand is that the production of race is deeply tied to the project of slavery in in the modern era. So how do you then disarticulate the logics of capitalism from the logics of racialization in that way? It's a kind of Marxist vibe that also mm -hmm. kind of disremembers um, the, the the critical and central role of slavery in 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 racialization of the economy. So I I think that one has to think through these questions as indices of power that intersect in different ways and that have different valence depending on on where one is situated i don't think that one can necessarily um produce a kind of stable formula for for how these um these power indices intersect and how they play out in space it's very sort of contingent i think right yeah and 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 i think to to go back to the um maybe from sort of the vantage of a designer or, or a practitioner right i mean um to think about tools and devices so i think you know you discussed a lot <laughs> about the queue right so i have right. to come back to the queue and i have to yeah right. so you know the queue so you, you talked about the queue as a you know when it can be used as a device of the state right as a tool for control and and for enclosure uh, in many ways, but but also the the sort of power of waiting um, as a maybe kind of tool of resistance, so used from the other side, right? I, I'm thinking about, for example, um, like work stoppages, right, and mm -hmm. and things like that. And so, I, I wonder if you could speak a little more about those tools and the idea that actually they can be repurposed and refashioned, and and sort of um, where and how delay uh, becomes a spatial device for you know for good in a sense or for um, you know, as a as a kind of tool of resistance as well. I mean, I think I think that it's you're asking me questions that I think you already have the answer to. I think it's really instructive that that Ashley um, 
that that the organizers had a moment of pause before the beginning of the conference, which is really like, let's take a moment to ground ourselves in this space and this time and to be fully present to each other. Um, and that's where waiting or pausing or delay is productive. And it's about a certain kind of sociality and presence, like an intensification of um, of pleasure, of, mo of 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 thoughtfulness, of 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 communion, of fellowship. So it's very it's very useful in that sense. And I'm thinking about what it, what does it mean, for instance. And this is a conversation that I had with Abdul Malik Samoan last year, around the tensions between calculability and incalculability. That in in a kind of in spatial terms, right? That the that the Euclidean grid is about a certain kind of transparency and calculability, where everything can be located by very precise temporal and spatial coordinates, and everything is accounted for, and everything has a kind of distinct and discrete function and meaning. Um, so in a in a spatial system that is described by somebody like you know Emmanuel Admasu, for instance, in his discussion of Mercator, you have you have the terror system, which is something much more what much more dynamic, much more mobile, that enables like shifts in in the spatial organization of of trade and the organization of social relations. It's amenable to a kind of recalibration that's ongoing and that's negotiable. So I think that there are already models that exist. What doesn't exist is is, is sufficient attention to those models. And I think that that's where the role of, of design research um, and, and, and design tools have to come together, that it's not simply about developing a toolkit and applying it, but actually being attentive to those spatial practices. Another example for me was like going to a hair salon in Wilmington, Delaware. I was just like, ah, oh, I have like the Black Matters conference. My hair's a mess. What am I going to do? So I just went on right. Google and I just Black African hair braiding practices, <laughs> Black hair braiding salon. And I just got, and I just went to the nearest one with like a two mile radius. Yeah. So I'm there for like five hours hanging out. And there's like, there's South African music. There's Nigerian music. There's Ghanaian gospel music playing um, on, 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 on the TV. And then halfway through getting my hair done, a woman arrives and there's like a mobile African kitchen. Right. So there's so there's a way in which um, there's a way in which allowing room for for the unaccounted for the or for or for for the incalculable is important. So maybe more generosity mm. and and less and less linearity in the way that we think about the ways in which people can occupy um and inhabit space. And part of the thing with calculability is, is that it's tied to a kind of capitalist logic. So I'm also taking a class at the Harvard Business School. So it's about, is it scalable? Is it measurable? Is it replicable? So there are all of these metrics that are really tied into a kind of um, capitalist notion of like when spaces are serviceable, when they are viable, but maybe we need an, another set of indices around when a space is actually viable and usable beyond those kinds of capitalist metrics. Absolutely. I love that. I, t I mean, I have the exact same, literally I've had the same experience. <laughs> I, was in, I was in San Francisco for a wedding. I was like, what do I do? I yelped black barber and like, <laughs> I walked into the shop, but you know, and then I go there and then, you know, it's obviously, you know, I'm at the barber shop. I get like invited to a cookout. Like it's like, it's, it's like, it's sort of this, this suspension uh, that sort of suspended. Right. And totally uh, it's like, I could have split a path and sort of had a completely different experience of the trip right and just skip the wedding and this whole this sort of yeah that 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 to me is exactly what black temporality means in a way and that's uh that actually brings us to a really um i think a great question that also came in through the chat um which talks about i guess the um, our present moment right and so our uh the fact that we're talking to each other through a screen you know this pandemic and and i guess uh maybe you could speak a little bit about ways that um, similar to kind of measurability, right? The idea of the linearity of time actually, right? And what that actually, um, what impacts that has on how we treat each other, right? With care and with empathy. I think um, I, I, we were really glad to be able to have Ashley at the beginning of today's program, right? To really take a moment and to pause and, and, and yeah, what are the ways in which actually linearity uh, is another sort of, um, yeah, distractor from you know caring about one another right i mean i think that 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 probably goes back to the question of tools right that mm -hmm. that 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 we've kind of been made to think that the modernist toolbox is the only toolbox that's available and it's a linear right. toolbox and it's about progression and it's about efficiency and all of these things so so what does it mean to have like abundance to have expansiveness as another measure of of how of how one one thinks about um 
of how one thinks about space um, mm -hmm. and allowing allowing room for for the strange and the odd and 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 the outsider as as a constitutive part of of who one is. So it's like letting go of purity, letting go of notions of authenticity, and actually being much more promiscuous um, mm -hmm. in the way that one thinks about one's space and place. Right. I don't I, think that the problem is with black people in imagining time. I think the problem is that we're inserted in a system that demands linearity, that demands transparency, but at the same time is affecting our own sort of like displacement, our own kind of erasure. So there's right. something violent about linearity because it doesn't allow room for multiplicity or contradiction. Right, right. Which is which is also why it's great, you know, when you um, your sort of first case study and talking about hair braiders, right, and that sort of very, um, I mean, that's, it's a really intimate act, right? I mean, to braid somebody's hair, right? I mean, you're getting very close to them. You might pull a little too hard, it's a little tender, you know, it is this very embodied um, and it actually, you know, in that thinking about hair braiding is actually uh, a totally, a way of recalibrating what spatial practice means, right? And it is sort of very embodied and, and situated as opposed to the more sort of disembodied, um, ways that architectural or urban kind of design pedagogy in general um, teaches us, right? The sort of the canons, the modernist canons. Um, yeah. And I think that, I think that what, what my, my, my whole beef is really that, that there's so much more, there's, there's an abundance of, of, of practices, of experiences that, um, that we could be and should be paying more attention to and finding, finding ways to learn from it. Not that, you know, the hair braiding salon is superior to other spaces, but it is another space that mm -hmm. informs the way that people are able to navigate, survive, make community in, mm -hmm. in, in very hostile spaces that have basically been designated as slum, as abandoned, as, as devoid of value. So um, I know that we have to close like in four minutes. We do. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm seeing a question here from Somala, which is really mm -hmm. how... Um, how do I treat um, or think about uh, subjugated histories? And I think that, you know, it's it's part of the conversation we had over lunch yesterday that one of the things that was really sort of key for me in my curatorial practice was really understanding myself as infrastructure, but not necessarily the center. So to be kind of like multi-centered and to be in dialogue and in community and fellowship with multiple collaborators um, is not about me doing the heroic work of resurfacing subjugated histories, but creating what, what you know, Evelyn Hammonds describes as spaces of articulation. And, and I think that this idea of articulation is really important, which is very different to like being tokenized or being represented or being hyper visible. It's about, you know, beyond visibility, they ha you have to create conditions of possibility and resource make resources available that enable people to ask the questions and explore the questions that they want to explore. And my job is really sort of to be like the administrator to a certain degree terrible administrator, horribly inefficient, <laughs> but <laughs> somebody's got to do it. And that happens to be me. So that, you know, so I think, I think that, um, that for me, it's really about be decentralizing myself and having a deeply sort of decentralized practice and hyper mobile practice in, in, in what I do and also being open to working across disciplines and across media. So I've been very fortunate mm -hmm. to be able to work incredibly talented musicians, um, visual artists, photographers, animators, who all bring, and, and cartographers, who all bring very different um, uh, knowledges to, to the table. And, and that's just given me a lifetime of stuff to unpack and, and think through. So mm -hmm. I think that um, abundance is really important. And the other, the other dimension, which was in relation to a conversation we had about Toni Morrison yesterday, was love. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that before before everything else, and the thing that drives everything is love. And and in many ways, when the funding failed, when the infrastructure failed, when I missed a flight, when I didn't get a visa, when I didn't understand how to navigate a city, or when I, you know, there were so many things that didn't work in in enacting African mobilities. And in truth, the thing that held it together was love and a shared vision. So thinking through this question of like a constellation of genius, brilliant people um, who have a shared vision was, was one way of sort of distributing the work um, and sharing the vision, but also multiplying the voices. Um, so it's more of a spiral than a, a what's that, mm -hmm. a spoken wheel. Right. Spoken wheel model. Right. Yeah. Those I love virus. that. I mean, that's a, I mean, perfect way to close us out. I think also that's, you know, that is 
hopefully what we get at and a positive thing, right, about us all being forced to be online in this way is that there is a, a sort of a decentralization. And uh, I love that you use the word constellation as indicated clearly by our um, spacey background, right? That's something we've been talking so much about. Um, so thank you so much for that. And, and hopefully, you know, this conference can also serve as that kind of constellation um, in a way in that you all as, you know, in the audience can all find one another and sort of collaborate in those decentralized ways too. So. Just very quickly, I just wanted to say that Black in Design is um, the second time that I'm speaking at Harvard publicly, and the first time was through the Black and African Student Organization at Harvard GSD about three years ago. So I take it, I take it as um, really meaningful that that the spaces where I'm invited to speak and to be in conversation is with. Um, young black designers and so um when everything else falls apart i feel like i'm doing something right because i'm talking to the people i want to be talking to so thank you again for the for the invitation and for the great questions and the dialogue thank you so much Mpo. thank you <laughs>